Yeah, if you are a, a flyer, can you just stick your hand up just so now I know proportionally who I'm talking to? Uh, right, I, I can see a lot of hands go up there. That's good. And if, if you're not a flyer as well, uh, like a, a partner of, um, can you stick your, your paws up for me? Um, and is anybody completely unfamiliar with flying in aeroplanes? Still got some hands up there. Okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll bear that in mind. Thank, thanks very much. That's, that's great. Okay. Bump. Uh, so the flow of this, uh, what I'll do is, is I'll crack off with basically a brief history of me so you know who is talking. I think that helps to add context to the, the conversation uh, and basically how I ended up where I did uh, from the past. Uh, I'll then go through uh, some uh, highlights or maybe even some lowlights or some scary bits from my time during test pilot school. Um, the, the test pilot school in itself is, is about, you know, you can make a, a movie about it um, and it's about two books worth of stuff. Um, so I'll just pick out a few little bits that uh, just stuck in my memory uh, about the test pilot uh, course. Uh, at the very end, um, if you can try and save your questions for the end, that would be great. If you've got something that you're desperate to know and it really would, um, you'd be missing something if you didn't, then uh, do ask, just stick your hand up. Uh, I probably won't see it, but Mike will, because I'll be too um, tunnel focused in talking. So do that. And then just, uh, if you can, during the, the, the um, presentation, just send Mike any questions you've got and I'll answer those at the end. Um, I, I've, got, I've got no end time, so I can stay as long as you as you want to talk and question and chat and that sort of stuff. Um, and after the presentation, I'm happy to go along with hand waving and lamp swing stories. Uh, me professionally, what I do here, um, I'm, as uh, Mike said, I'm a flying instructor and a licensing examiner. So I give people their flying licenses, which is kind of a nice privilege to have uh, and teach a lot of the people who I'm talking to tonight. Uh, I, my main job is across the road as an experimental and developmental test pilot, uh, flying generally the Hercules and sometimes other aircraft that you may have seen coming out of Cambridge, which I'm not supposed to talk about, but you will know about, obviously. Um, I also uh, lecture um, undergrad engineering and maths, uh, hence my garb tonight. I've just come from doing that. And I am also an author, more of that later. Um, and I do editing uh, for other authors, uh, which is uh, a bit like telling them their baby's ugly. It's quite a, quite a tough job. Uh, my background then, um, uh, at university, I flew the Bulldog, which is the top right-hand uh, aeroplane, uh, then joined the Air Force after that uh, in the old days when we had the Jet Provost Mark III and then the Jet Provost Mark V, so just various light trainers. And then went on to the Hawk, which is one of my favorite aeroplanes ever. Uh, it's like a Ford Fiesta. It's simple, underpowered, but great fun, never goes wrong. Then uh, I was an instructor on my first tour on the Takano, which um, taught me about bad aircraft design um, and production. Uh, that was a real pig of an aeroplane, uh, but it taught me some good stuff. A bit like learning to drive a Land Rover. Um, anything else after that seems quite simple. After that, it was back to the, uh, the Hawk again, but this time as a weapons platform. So we've done the flying stuff and now we were using the airplane as a weapon system. Uh, that was pretty tough uh, physically, emotionally and uh, mentally. Uh, then off to fly the Mighty Tornado. Um, its list of good qualities includes and is limited to it goes fast. Um, that's about it. But again, I learned an awful lot on that airplane. Um, I had some interesting times. Uh, were spent a lot of time here in um, somewhere hot and sandy, uh, did uh, six stints out there, sorry, five stints out there, uh, lived in those things with spy camel spiders and snakes and scorpions. Um, and again, learned lots about operating airplanes in uh, hostile environments, not just people throwing things at you, but in terms of temperatures and pressures and stuff like that out in the middle of um, the desert. I had a lot of time out flying operationally, um, downtime, because operational flying is actually more straightforward than training. So I did a master's in medical physics just to pass the time, distance learning with the Open University, which was handy for my uh, test pilot course, more of that in a minute. Uh, then I was lucky enough to um, go on exchange to Canada to fly the CF-18, which is a single seat multi-role aircraft. Um, so I was an instructor on the operational uh, conversion unit for the students there. And also worked with their sort of test flying establishment, uh, AT, AETE, uh, as a operational test and evaluation pilot. Then uh, we start with the, the meat of it really, um, was the test pilot school. Uh, this is a picture of my, um, the course on day one, uh, 
with uh, Chuck Yeager's F-104 aircraft in the background. That's the one that got the um, height uh, record. I think it was 104,000 feet or something like that. It's uh, it's it's, uh, rock, it's uh, got a jet, sorry, got a rocket pack on the back of it so it can zoom up to super height. So it's cheating, um, but it, it, it did get the world height record out of that. Well, uh, so the test pilot school itself then, it's uh, Edwards Air Force Base in the Mojave Desert. It's massive. Um, this is my laser point. The Cambridge runway is from there to there, okay? And Cambridge would airport would fit in sort of about here. Um, the main runway concrete is 15,000 feet long, um, extending to 51,000 feet out into the desert. You can't really see it here, but it goes off into the desert. Uh, and here's the desert strips. There's about five different runways on the desert. You can sort of see some of them uh, here. And that was, we'll come on to that later. Um, it was a six mile drive from the main gate to my to my house onto the base. So it's, it's that big, it really is massive. Uh, and this was the area here down to the left where you did your spinning training and out of control training. So if you crashed, it was quite easy to just uh, mop the airplane up from here. Or if you still had your, uh, if you were still flying, you could do a practice or a force landing onto the airfield, which I did in an F-16 and that was fun. Um, pop. Yeah, so the place, uh, it's, um, you pitch up there and it really is uh, sort of shocking or it's, it's just huge. They've got loads of money um, and everything about it just, just sends you, it's like welcome to Alcatraz for those that have seen the film. Um, it's a year's course. Um, it's actually probably about a three or four year course crammed into a year. Uh, you've got two weeks off in the middle. Uh, it's like, though that's more of uh, two weeks without lectures and flying. So you can catch up with the six months you've got behind on the first six months of the course. Um, Hard work, about 12 hours a day, um, Monday to Saturday, and then six hours on a Sunday. So you couldn't keep that up for more than a year. So it was quite, uh, quite tiring, it has, has to be said. Um, on your first day there, you, uh, you go down the corridor from the test pilot school into the classroom and you look at the walls either side of you and you've got all the um, graduating or the people who graduated from Edwards before and on this particular course. And there are some names up there that will probably be familiar to you. Gus Grissom, Ken Mattingly, uh, Deke Slate, and Charles Duke, etc. And you, it re, it's a, a very humbling experience um, to know that you're about to start the same thing as these, these people went through. And will you make it? Um, the big shock is on day one is your, your PT test, where you've got to run a mile and a half um, in a certain time. And of course, all the foreigners like me came last because we didn't we haven't, hadn't run for about 15 years. And all the Americans, super fit, square jaw, flat head, off they went and beat the living daylights out of us. Um, then it was the maths exam, a two-hour maths exam, which if you fail, you're sent back to your unit. Um, that was quite hard at the time. It was, it was probably A-level standard at my age, A-level, so about sort of mid-university mid level now. Um, so that was, a, that was a bit of a challenge. And then we had the, uh, another shock of the class intros. So 24 of us on the course. And uh, of course, we all were told to stand up individually and introduce ourselves and what our background was. And, First guy stands up and he says, uh, hi, I'm Captain, Captain John Shawowski, F-15, F-16, my master's at Harvard, my PhD at MIT, I did this. It's like, that's impressive. He must be the brains of the course. So he sits down, next guy gets up. I'm Lieutenant Commander John Wachanski. I've got a PhD in this and a master's in this. And I wrote this paper and it went on like that. So these people were, were very, very bright. I was up against. Um, as a guy with just two degrees in science, I was the uh, most, the least qualified person on that course. So I, I had to work very hard on the academics. And it really was a, what am I doing here? Bloke from a, a terrace in Watford. Bump. Um, that's the, obviously the advert picture for the, for the, the lecture. That's my fellow student, uh, Link, Lincoln, Lincoln Bonner, who uh, was a, or is a flight test engineer. Um, and I'll come on to that in a minute, but he's the only ever big, muscly black guy I've ever knocked unconscious. More of that in a minute. Not quite what it sounds. Um, the course I did, they were still running the old syllabus, so lifting bodies, so space shuttle approaches and stuff like that. So I had the privilege of flying with some astronauts um, in uh, various airplanes and simulators to do, to do that kind of stuff, which uh, will stick with me forever. Um, and the hardest part of the course for me was the academics. Um, every two weeks, we were given a different set of academics. So compressible aerodynamics, equations of motion, uh, and they would get the top person, like the Harvard professor of equations of motion in to do us, to teach us, and then an exam at the end of the two weeks to see how much we'd retained, and then an exam at the end of the three day exam at the end of the, um, the course to see how much you've retained from the whole course, which was a bit of a shocker. 
uh, airplanes, lots of those. Um, the, the, the course, basically, they just throw anything they can, they can at you in terms of uh, helicopters, airplanes, sailplanes, uh, flying boats, um, fast jets, slow jets, multi-engine pistons, single-engine piston gliders, um, all, all sorts. I think mean, we flew about uh, 25 to 30 uh, fun, very fundamentally different types of airplane. Um, most of the ones you can see up on the screen there, I'm going to talk to you about um, uh, during the next uh, next little bit. Uh, and Mike, sorry, could you could Mike, could you tell me when I've hit um, 25 minutes, please, on the talk, just so I know whether to speed up, slow down, or miss bits out? Thank you. Uh, all good so far. Everyone happy? Right, got some nods. We like that. <laughs> it's always horrible on Zoom doing this because I can't I can't hear anyone. I can just see see things. Um, yeah, thumbs up as well. <laughs> yeah, thumbs up is good. We like that. Um, you're on the course. You're foreigners, so they try and hide you away from all the the secret stuff going on. Uh, but where you know you can't unsee some things, and we saw some stuff that we weren't supposed to see um, around the place, which I obviously can't talk about because this is being recorded. Um, yeah, one of the, the first things they get you to fly is this thing here. It's, it's called the UH-16 Albatross. It's a flying boat, World War II plus, I think. Um, it's got massive radial engines on the thing. Um, and even starting it up is a nightmare. You've got to have somebody stood on top of the wing with the panels open, banging the engines with a broom, whilst three of you move levers and valves and circular things in the cockpit trying to get those engines going. Um, they, they, they give us this airplane to fly to teach us that you've got to be very careful um, when you when you look at something, just, just to, that it might bite, and this one did. Um, and they gave us a bit of a clue. They said to us, on this particular aeroplane, what we want you to do is to line up on the far hand, far left-hand side of the runway, so your, your left main wheel on the left-hand side of the runway, pointing 30 degrees to the right of the center line, okay, uh, which looks very, very odd. And they said, well, when you take off and the throttles are above you in this thing, above your head, it's fantastic. The, the window opens as well. So you put your hand out and your throttles, we well, haven't because you're trying to fly it. Um, they say, you want to put full right um, aileron, full right rudder, and you'll need some right brake as well. Uh, he said, but I'm pointing to the right and I'm on the left-hand side of the runway. But as you go, you put the throttles up and whatever you do, the airplane uh, doesn't and it goes left. Uh, and as you reach about 50 knots, you're in the middle of the runway, pointing down the runway. Um, so if you'd lined up on the middle of the runway, uh, you'd have been off it. And it just goes to show you that you, you can't really, you can't trust some, some things. You've got to be very careful um, with that. So uh, I think the take, out, take away from that was um, get all the gen on any airplane you fly. If it's a bit unusual, um, you know, you might get that from mates or the internet or whatever. And then when you've got that gen, apply it to that particular airplane. So, you know, if it requires any kind of special handling, um, do that uh, rather than get caught out with it and just be ignorant and get get the unexpected and end up on unexpected road. You don't want to do that. Uh, the next one is um, uh, the F-16. This was our main uh, course airplane uh, on the course there. Lovely, lovely little thing. Um, very, very simple. It's a bit like a glider, obviously, except with a massive engine. Um, very small, very, very dainty, delicate little thing. Um, and it's often, they say, the simple things that will catch you out. Uh, and it was, was, in fact, in this case, I was flying this airplane, the two-seat version, with my, with my large um, flight test engineer, who had a very limited sense of humor. Uh, and we were taking, we were doing fuel consumption trials. So looking, I was calling out numbers like fuel flow and speed and altitude. Uh, and he was writing them all down in the back there. And you, if you've been to the States, you might know they're very, very tense about controlled airspace. Uh, and I was approaching some controlled airspace um, and I, my, my backseater said to me, um, I need, I said to him, I've got to turn in about 30 seconds for airspace. And he said, I need a minute. Well, okay, so I carry on flying. And uh, I said, Link, I've got to turn in about 20 seconds for airspace. And he goes, I need another 40 seconds. Oh, cool. So I carried on. Um, and then air traffic said to me, you need to turn hard, hard left right now. So I turned hard, hard left, which in an F-16 is a 9G, instantly like that, through 180 degrees. And when you're doing Mach 0.95, that lasts about 20 seconds. So I did my hard turn, and uh, Link had stopped talking. So oh, this is not good. Uh, looked over my shoulder, and I just saw the top of a, top of a helmet doing this. And poor Link, had, uh, I'd knocked him out, because uh, I turned hard without telling him. Anyway, he, he came to, as you do after a, a G-lock, um, and I thought, I'll tell you what, I'm going to try and pretend this never happened, because I know you get very confused after G-lock. 
anyway, um, link came to, and I started just talking about parameters and fuel flows and all that stuff. And I thought, I've got away with it. He hasn't realized that I've done this massive turn and he's gone unconscious. I can't believe it. And then he says to me, hey, we were heading east. <laughs> so I got busted. <laughs> so interesting time in the bar afterwards. So the moral of that one, I think, is um, communicate with people. If you're in an aeroplane. Um, I was particularly bad as a single seat pilot. I just did my own thing. Uh, but now we're carrying passengers and family and that sort of stuff. So uh, make sure they know what you're going to do. If you can do something abrupt, same with their traffic. Just, just let them know. Otherwise, you might um, knock out somebody big like I did. Um, next one up it was our thing called our performance check ride. Um, and the, the heavy aircraft guys, not the fast jet guys, the heavy guys would do it in the F-15, in this case, the F-15E. Um, and this was all about... Uh, prior preparation and imagination and we had to do a performance check on the aeroplane to see how you know how fast it would go how how fast it would climb how, how hard it would turn etc and my, my friend who was a b1b pilot uh, had a little clipboard and he was going to note down every thousand feet of the of the max performance climb so every thousand feet he was going to note down airspeed temperature fuel flow loads of other parameters, okay? What he'd failed to realize was this airplane in a performance climb climbs at a thousand feet per second, okay? And so obviously his, his plan <laughs> to record fuel figures every thousand feet didn't work. Um, anyway, he came down, a chap called Jack, and I, we said, oh, how'd it go, Jack? He says, it, it was the best fun trip I've ever, ever had. Oh, did you, did you pass? He goes, oh, no, I failed. I've got to do it again, which is <laughs> <Just> great. <laughs> so um, just shows you. Um, so I think the moral of that is think things through, particularly if you're if you're flying a higher performance aircraft, which some of you might sometime. Um, use your imagination. Think well, what's it actually going to be like when I'm in that airplane, um, and don't be her really, because Jack said he was just literally hanging on a rope about ten thousand foot long to this thing. Uh, for me, the the hard workload was flying the heavy aircraft because I'd, I'd never done it. I've always been a fast jet pilot. Um, and my first time ever flying a heavy aircraft was um, uh, air to air refueling against another heavy aircraft. Um, in this case, this is um, that's actually an RAF AWACS. It's got the it's got the big mushroom on the back of it, but it's it's a 707 that I was flying, um, and I got to, to sit in the left hand seat about 20 seconds before this happened uh, in the pre contact position, having never flown a heavy before or formation in a heavy. And as I said, get on with it, do it. So, okay. Um, and from that, the learning point was, uh, for me, when my, my workload gets very, very high, when I'm very busy, when I'm trying really, really hard, I, I hold on to the control column really, really tight. I try and squeeze juice out of it. And if you think logically, you, you don't need to do that, do you? I mean, you, you, th that doesn't help anybody. Um, but it was just an indicator for me, and it's different for everyone, that when you're working hard, it, you, you will do, you will exhibit certain symptoms. Uh, and for me, it's crushing, crushing the control column. For some people, your hearing goes, you don't hear air traffic, you don't hear other things. For some people, they, they'll do checks twice or they'll miss things. Um, so it's a good indicator for your workload. If you start to find yourself doing your own telltale signs, take a step back and go, do I really need to be working this hard? Or at least make other people aware in the airplane that you're working very hard. And you can either do with some assistance or just, just back off a bit. Uh, something else you can do is chair flying. If you're gonna go and do it, I used to do this as a student. Um, we did it on the course there, is uh, if you're gonna go and do a trip, do it in a chair first, in this case, trolley, um, which I stole from the commissary at Edwards um, and got one of my many um, tellings off and had to write a letter of apology. Um, my defense was that on a Friday night in England, everyone steals trolleys and rides in them. Um, but apparently that wasn't, wasn't good enough. You don't do that in the States. So I had to write a letter of apology to them. Anyway, here we are practicing what's called an airborne pickup, um, where we're, we're basically flying in the circuit while another airplane is taking off from the ground and you meet up together. Uh, we're just practicing the communications, etc. And it, it made a huge difference to, to do our little trolley trial um, and just get the, 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 the sequence and words right. Um, so I recommend that if you're ever going to do like a test or even an A check, B check, just go through it in your head first. Sit, sit in a chair, just go through it. What's going to happen? Again, use your imagination. Uh, think about the what ifs. Um, here's one. Um, pride comes before a fall. I'm sure we've all been, been there when we've reached a certain number of hours and you think, you know, I'm actually pretty good at this. And you get a little bit showy, offy and cocky. Um, and I was... Uh, the best fun part of the course for me was flying gliders, at Edwards. Um, it teaches you a lot about yourself uh, and the atmosphere because you're connected straight to it. 
So we spent two weeks up at the Tachapi Mountains, literally soaring with eagles. Um, and I, I found an eagle after I've been gliding for about an hour and 20 total. I thought I was really good by this point. I thought I'd show it how you do thermaling. Uh, and it, it, uh, it entered the same thermal as me, it came and joined me. Uh, and it, within about two minutes, it was about 3,000 feet above me, looking down going, yeah, get some of that. Um, because I suppose really they, their brain is full of, you know, a million years worth of aerodynamics and atmospheric uh, processing. And my brain only had about an hour's gliding in it. So a bit of a humbling experience. So if you ever find yourself feeling a little bit proud and cocky, think about that. Because uh, pride comes before a fall or a crash. Oops. Um, so be humble. Uh, it's, um, I find that easy when I'm on my own, but it's just a bit more difficult when you're with other people. Um, Bob. Uh, the real leveler for me at the test pilot course was flying this thing. How many helicopter pilots we got here? Do we have anyone helicopter pilot? No, got can't see any hands. Oh, someone's raised a hand. George has raised a hand. Here. Right, okay, two. That, that's good. So you'll not all know what I mean by transition. Um, I, I I worked so hard doing this that I actually stopped breathing. And the guy flying with me says, "You, you need to keep breathing, buddy." Um, honestly, I I just have not worked so hard in my life. Um, and this helicopter's a all. There's no stabs in it. It's all manual. It's got a twisty pulley up throttle and everything. Um, and again, I was squeezing juice out of the out of the thing. Um, and landing in small confined strips and that sort of stuff. Having never flown a helicopter before, uh, it was probably the, at that point, the hardest I've ever, ever, ever worked in my life. Um, I got out of that aeroplane, I fell out of it um, and I could wring my flying gloves out. There was literally water coming out of them. Um, I lay on the ground for two hours and I slept for about 15 hours after that, after that flight. Um, I think the, there's the, I guess the moral of that story is when you've done something really, really, really uh, high workload like that is you'll be knackered and you'll be out of what's called tracking juice. You know, you've all seen it when you're on your last circuit after an hour circuits and you're just getting sloppy and scrappy. Um, so for me, it was just the driving home, you know, afterwards I was, I was sort of practically falling asleep. Um, so just watch yourself after you've had a really hard trip, uh, particularly towards the end. And also if you've, um, if you've, if you've, um, if you've worked hard and you know you've worked hard, then you, you might end up uh, uh, planting yourself in, into a ditch. Uh, so have a rest after you've had a, a, an ex a very busy sortie. Um, this fella, uh, the T-38, um, interesting that they're a plane, it's the, the American equivalent of our Hawk. It's not as nice to fly. Uh, it's got some very strange characteristics. It's, um, it's very buffety. Obviously, we're taught to avoid the buffet in small aeroplanes, um, but in this aircraft, uh, in the final turn, you fly in the light buffet, and in the final turn, flapless, you fly in the medium buffet. Uh, it's horrible, and you have to control your turn uh, or your AOA with power. So everything's it's a bit like an F4 Phantom. It's very, very uncomfortable. Um, the roll rate in this aeroplane, and I'm not making this up, is 720 degrees a second. Think about that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so it's got very, very, very powerful ailerons. Um, and of course, because it's, it's pointy and skinny, there's not much, uh, you don't need much uh, force to actually get it to turn. Uh, this nearly killed me on the course. Uh, hard trip, coming back, done the final turn. So in my mind, all over, all the hard bits over, the final turn's done. All I've got to do now is put this on the ground. So I'm flying the aeroplane down to the ground and around about 20 feet, instantly the aeroplane snap rolls to 45 degrees left um uh, left wing down which was a bit of a shocker um so i immediately instinctively put full right aileron on uh, and pretty much full right rudder and at the wings leveled as i touched down on the runway um and then of course i neutralized controls we never found out what it was that did that to the airplane it could have been uh, uh, some uh you call it vortices or weird weather or something odd um, and the back, my backseat never even noticed. He, he didn't realize that I applied controls to do that. Um, but it just shows you've got to stay sharp and it's not over until you're back in the crew room uh, with, a, with a cup of tea. Um, I know people who've walked into propellers before getting out of airplanes. Uh, that picture there is a T-38, well it was uh, in the middle of that and two dead people uh, trying to land it. This was fun. Um, this is the biggest single engine piston I've ever flown. Uh, it's just massive, um, but it's got a stall speed of something like 27 knots or, or, or thereabouts, 23 knots. So you land it about 30 knots. Um, so you, you can actually land 
vertically that well I did it was just such a weird experience you just come the wind's 25 knots on in the face you just come straight down um and you're told by the um the instructors that the direction you're pointing in when you land this is the direction you'll be rolling out on the runway um so you you work very hard to make sure that the fuselage is aligned with the runway center line uh because it, it does it's bizarre I don't know why but it just it just goes off in the direction you you, you actually landed it's like a toy it seems to be unsteerable I don't know no real moral of that story, just thought it was interesting. Uh, this aeroplane, again, no moral to this one. It's this uh, T2 Buckeye, I think, this one. But the the uh, Navy use it for spin training. We did some spin training. I did about, on one trip, about 19 different spins in this. Uh, you do inverted spins, flat spins, head over heel spins, um, all, all high rotational spins. It's it's the, probably the best fun trip you do on the, on, on the course. Um, but again, you are knackered afterwards. Um, the, you've probably seen or may have seen this, the video of these one of these things getting stuck in a high rotational spin, does about 30 turns of spin before it comes out, and then it reverses and does a 10 the other way. But they get it out, but it, it's a very interesting aeroplane to spin, which is why they give you the spin training on the course. You're about 25 minutes now, Stu. So. Perfect. Okay, great. Thanks. I know I'm talking fast. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just sorry to get in. Um, yeah, at the end of the course, they give you a project basically to see how you manage projects. So it's a test effectively. And they say, right, your mission or our mission was to devise a system whereby we could fly an airplane uh, using uh, as a blind pilot. So using sound only as a, as a cue. Um, and what we have was, uh, you can see on top of my head here, I've got a, um, well, hair for a start. Um, and also I've got a, a, an INS uh, on top of my head. Which, which detects where my head's pointing. So as I, if I turn my head like this or down and up, it can detect that. Um, and as you turn your head, it changes the, the relative signal going into your ears. So you can hear, hear differently from left to right, like stereo. Um, and as the airplane pitches down, the tone of the, you have music played in your ears, the tone of the music goes down. And as you pitch up, the tone goes up. So you just pitch the airplane. So the music sounds normal, okay? And that's how you get it straight um, and level, sorry. And the turns, you hear a beep in one ear and you just turn the airplane until the beep comes from the front. And then we managed to fly the thing um, straight and level onto headings, just using sound, which we were quite pleased with. Um, I got in trouble during the report because I called this a flannel, and the Americans weren't happy about that. It, was, it was, wasn't technically enough. It, it's a flannel. <laughs> what do you want me to call it? So I, I called it the Vision Restriction Device 2000. They were much happier with that because that sounded very, very, uh, very, very good. Um, that was quite nice. They gave us a rating on the C12 Huron, which is uh, what we call it, the um, King Air. Uh, so I got to got a rating on that, which is kind of nice. Uh, oops, that's right. And then uh, a year later, uh, but what felt like five years older, we uh, we graduated from the the course. Um, uh, looking back on it, it was uh, a real privilege to, to have done that course um, and uh, to have flown with some of the people that we did and uh, been taught by some of the most brilliant minds in the world, really. Um, there's one chap who, I, I, he's right at the end here, he's, he's probably can't see him, I can't move my mouse over there, but he's a chap called Jeff Peer, who's my F-16 conversion instructor. He has the record for the most phantom guns kills in the world. Um, he was caught during the um, Arab-Israeli war and was a POW for, for two years. So he's got some, or had some very interesting stories to tell us all. Um, amongst the others, there are, there, are, there are SR-71 pilots there, there are U-2 pilots, astronauts, um, all kinds of very interesting people. We had the, we had the world gliding champion teaches gliding, obviously, because it's the Edwards Test Pilot course. Uh, you can see me, yours truly there, um, just on the graduation. Um, I got in trouble a little bit on the course because, as you might have noticed, I have a sense of humour, um, and that didn't often um, interface well with the Americans. So I found myself uh, writing five letters of apology during my time on the course for inappropriate uh, humour, uh, as they judged it. Um, and uh, my final uh, final letter I got was had to write, uh, didn't have to write, was for this one. My graduation. I know the Americans are big into medals and stuff, so I. I Velcroed this on my chest, and it was a fold out medals. Some of them found it funny, some of them didn't, but I didn't care by then because I, I graduated and I was going home. <laughs> um, after I graduated, so we finished on the TP course now. Um, the, well, the reason I did the Edwards course, they put me on that one, was because uh, we flew very high performance aircraft there, the F 15, 16, um, and they wanted me to come and fly this beastie. 
so I, I did the basically the released a service for the typhoon, not not me on my own. I was involved in the project, um, but I got to fly the trips. Um, here you can see us or me, in fact, doing um, uh, care, low speed carefree handling with an asymmetric load. That's a oops, sorry. That's a um, laser guided bomb in a blue is means in a um, and you see on the back there's a spin shoot. So if things weren't um, peak tong, we just pull the spin shoot, get the airplane pointing at the, at the ground and then um, recover it. So that was slow and wobbly. Uh, and I got taught fantastically on the test pilot course how to do that. And, and the real proof of the pudding was this, you know, within a very short time of getting back to the UK, I was sat in this on my own doing proper envelope expansion stuff for a real uh, flight test um, program and airplane. It was fantastic. Um, they also put me in uh, a trip, which was uh, is more of this in my book. Um, more on that in a minute. Um, going fast, uh, they basically said to me, uh, but in technical language, see how fast it will go. So I did. Um, that was uh, an interesting experience. Um, oops, sorry, sorry. Uh, boink. Uh, I also, um, I think because I was the new guy, they, they made me do all the ultra high G um, test points and uh, test out all the new um, anti-G systems and life preservers and oxygen. So uh, that was that was very, very physically demanding. That was going from about minus three and a half to minus four, slamming to 9.3 uh, in, in less than a second. Uh, so it was to do with G onset rates and see, seeing how you could survive at various uh, high G onset rates, which you can't simulate in a, in a centrifuge. It doesn't do that. You need to go in the air and do it. Um, I had, because of these trips, I, I had the early stages of retinal detachment. Um, so I had to swap with somebody else who uh, to take over for a while. So my eyes kind of repaired themselves, which they did, thankfully. Um, which, if you uh, want to know, is you see spots and dots. You know the cartoons when the Tom and Jerry get hit on the head and you, you see all those spots and stuff? That's normally an indication that your retina is, is coming off. So if you see that, go and see a, a optician. Um, how was that? Uh, and yeah, then, uh, um, long story short, but I, I woke up uh, dead. No, I didn't. I, I was dead and I woke up in hospital about four years ago from a pulmonary embolism. Uh, and it kind of focused my mind a little bit on what I did with my life. And I thought, you know, I've always wanted to write a book. So I did. Um, and this uh, this is, is my, my effort of that book. Um, you can get it on Amazon. Uh, and it's basically a um, uh, sort of, a, I don't want to say a mic take, but a very honest uh, look at my, my sort of career flying airplanes, all the mistakes I've made, all the mistakes I've seen, um, a lot of kind of humorous sort of pilot related stuff. Uh, but it's aimed at sort of, the general public not not specifically pilots um there's a lot in there that's uh i wasn't allowed to talk about i got into a bit of trouble when i tried to publish some of it so i've had to um uh disguise some of the some of the numbers and things in there but if you if you look carefully at my book you'll find some clues in there about some of those numbers bonk uh, it's called Sunrise at Dusk, by the way, it says it on the thing there, and that some of the things people have said about it. Um, I can't believe you actually wrote this stuff down. Um, but really, I just wanted to be honest about it um, and just crack open some of the sort of quiet or the unspoken things that go on, uh, which no one really talks about. And I thought if, if you could start to open up about human error and human uh, fallibility and, and stuff like that, uh, and just how you fit, and emo emotional stuff too, just you know being scared and uh, maxed out, and things like that. Uh, stuff that we all we all get, but we don't talk about because we're pilots and we're hard. Um, but it does happen to us, and it's good to get it out there and talk about it with your trusted mate over a few beers, because we're all thinking the same thing. Uh, we just don't talk about it. Um, other things they've said, yeah, um, didn't take that joiner job a few years ago. Some of my friends did. You might have seen that on the news recently. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, lots of, uh, I'm glad it wasn't me there, um, but I, I seem to have attracted all kinds of catastrophes during my, during my flying life. Um, I, I don't think any more so than anybody else. It just, I've just talked about them a bit more than, more than other people. Uh, I've no idea what time is now, but I think that's probably 35 minutes. And I think I'm finished doing my transmit bit. Um, how are we Mike for time? Uh, spot on. So you're at 35 minutes, perfect. Oh. So, yeah. Nice. Okay, that's amazing coincidence. Um, oh, Sam Boswell's come in. Uh, so really, that that kind of that mops it up for me. Um, I'm I'm done on transmit. Um, I'm happy to uh, answer questions about the presentation or any of the background photos you talked about. Uh, I talked about. Uh, um, 
on there because they some of them weren't related to the presentation they just were pretty photos from my from my past and flying uh, most of which i've taken myself not that one that's that's somebody's air show photo i just thought it looked really nice with all the um it's a great way of describing lift to people what's lift that 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 there that's lift <laughs> um so um over to over to mike to host questions i guess if they've been popping up during the presentation or have i been talking so fast you haven't had a chance to type uh, well nobody's written anything yet so just open <laughs> yeah, it, put their hands up and uh, and fire them away yeah any questions out there hmm, no. <laughs> nothing okay <laughs> I was going to ask Stu if I may, what was your scariest moment? On, on the course or in general? Just in general. Well, I, that's, that's a very hard question. I've had about well, lots of scary moments. Um, actually, it, it seems quite benign. Um, the, the scariest moment I had actually was, uh, wasn't in the air. It was in a simulator. Um, and it was a, a, an instrument rating test when I was a tornado pilot. Um, and it scared me because it, it, it well, I'll tell you why. I was flying an approach on the QNH or the QFE when I should have been on the other one. And the guy doing my test just let me do it in the simulator. And the simulator just stopped. And I'm like, what's happened? Why is it, why is it all gone black and dark? And he says, you just died. Um, and it, that's the, the, the first and last time I've ever crashed a sim. But it, was, it scared the life out of me because it, it made me realise that, that I, am, I can be killed. Uh, I, well, I have been tw twice already, but I got uh, fixed in hospital. Um, but it, yeah, it was it was that, that was the scariest actually. It was it was, it was realization that I'm not immune to these things because you always read about them and they always happen to other people, don't they? You, you, you look at it and you go, "What an idiot! Didn't he check his altimeter? Oh, didn't he see this? I now you know I, I had I had no idea. Bang, dead. That was it, uh, and that taught me a massively important lesson." Um, so that was my that was my scariest moment, but it was like psychological, I think, rather than physical. Um, but but aeroplane-wise, I'm just trying to think of the scariest. I, I, I actually probably um, I, I'm one of these people that gets scared when I'm having a cup of tea in the crew room, not in the air. Um, so I've, I've got a bit of a delay on. So I've had some really awful things happen, but my brain, I think it's Beche syndrome, um, beach battlefield syndrome. I, I don't panic or anything. Um, I just play a game of chess. I just deal with it and get on with it and fix it. But it was when I had icing, actually. It sounds quite benign, but I had icing um, in, a, in a Tucano. Um, and it got to the point where I was at full power and I was still descending. Um, and it, 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 it's one of those horrible things that gave me time to think about my fate. Um, and that was horrible. I just thought, well, I'm going to have to eject. And it was a really horrible feeling. It, it, it ended okay-ish. I can do more on that later. But um, yeah, that, that, was, that was scary. I couldn't see out the canopy, could see nothing. And when I did finally get into the circuit, I couldn't see out because there was covered in ice. And I put the gear down and it didn't come down because it was all, all the ice was, was on the bottom of the airplane. So I had to fly around for 30 minutes, IMC in the circuit till it all melted. Uh, and I, I was I was re I was a young guy, I was like 20, 21, 22, and I was petrified, absolutely petrified. So yes, that, I think that's my scariest moment in the air. <laughs> Good question, fella. <laughs> Thanks, Stu. Anybody else? Hmm. Must be something. Go on, anything. When, when, when did the women join these this elite group of people? Oh, since I've been in around, yeah. Um, we, we had, um, I mean, you know, back in the day, Eileen Collins. Uh, she was um, yonks ahead of me. You know, she was the commander of the um, uh, uh, space shuttle. Uh, flew with her uh, a couple of times uh, so she was probably about uh, 10 years ahead of me on the test pilot course um, so yeah it's it's been open in, in the states they're a bit more uh, were more liberal earlier in terms of getting women involved uh, in the air force we, we we start on my on my basic flying course we had we had a lady on that um, so in all my time in the air force it's been equal opportunities in terms of gender um, T t the women tend they, they just are less women pilots don't know why it, it could be probably just there's no difference in ability i mean i've been instructing for 25 years um and there's no perceivable difference between men and women uh overall at flying airplanes so you know i, I guess it's just a, it's just a, a thing that men more men probably want to do than women don't know 
Um, th does that answer the question, or, or, or do you have any more? Any no, more? I was just hit, I was interested in the history of how many test pilots ha have been women. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I couldn't give you. I mean, obviously, Eileen Collins, who I happen to know, but um, mm -hmm. quite a few. You know, um, mm -hmm. I could find out. I'm sure it's Googleable. No, 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 no just, <laughs> just interested. Thank you. It's, it's a very male-dominated world for mm -hmm. sure. You know, certainly mm -hmm. at the higher levels, uh, because the higher levels are were around when it was just men flying airplanes or men flying fighters basically yeah mm. a good question worth a... thank you Stu, how uh, how many hours do you have now and uh, how many types have you flown uh, not a lot not a lot actually um uh, i've got four just over four thousand hours um which is actually about the same as most of the apollo astronauts had when they went up um uh types wise uh, again not a huge amount i've got about 100 types uh flying um I, I would qualify that by saying i've cheated a bit so i've, I've considered single engine piston two types because there's tail draggers and uh, and and nose wheel airplanes and i've cheated with gliders as well so I, i've i've had self-powered gliders and uh winch launch gliders <laughs> um but um it, it, i think that's a funny question because some people say they've flown loads of types but what they've done is sat in the back and had a 10 minutes on the controls um, but uh, for me, uh, flying a type is you, you go from start to finish with you at the controls, from start up to shut down, doing all the bits and bobs. So about 100 different types. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, okay, so you've got some written questions now. Oh, right, go on. Yeah, so uh, one from Mike Guppy. What test yeah. do you agree to do? You, you, you can read these, presumably, Stu. I can't. Where, where am I reading? Right. Read them out so, got, so one from Mike Guppy. What test do you agree to do um, that after the event you wish you hadn't? Oh, that's that's interesting. Um, uh, mm, that's a really good question because um, it actually came up in my it comes up in my book and one of, it's one of my chapters it's, it's the high speed envelope expansion test um i although i'm pleased i did it if i'd known beforehand what the risk was i probably would have been a little bit less keen about doing it um so i didn't regret doing it and that's probably a bit of a weak answer for you um i think the oh no actually yeah sorry I, there is one test i, I um i was asked to do a last minute test on an airplane that i wasn't familiar with um, it was the, uh, I'm not, a, I'm a fighter pilot, not a bomber pilot. And it was the bomber version of the tornado it had a new, um, type of altimeter, uh, which was supposed to stop it hitting the ground. Uh, and to test that you have to fly it and try and hit the ground, not obviously try and hit the ground, but you, you need to make the airplane think you're going to hit the ground. Um, and to be honest, it, um, and I was just as much, just as guilty. Um, we hadn't really thought that through properly. Uh, we just said, let's throw the airplane to the ground and, and see if this thing works. Um, of course, we'd thought of what if it doesn't, but we hadn't really, really thought it through. I hadn't chair flown it. Okay, it was a real, real Friday afternoon. The main pilot for this airplane has gone off on leave. This needs to get done. You're the only pilot. Can you do it? Well, obviously, yes. Um, so I did it. And then I got back and thought, I was very lucky. And I was. Um, so, you know, sometimes luck is on your side. And I think that that's probably the trip that if I... Could rewind my life I would have not done I'd have said no I'm not prepared for that or no I don't think we've got the, the correct safety case out for it um, and what made me do it personal pride thought, test pilot I can do that you know different type but I can I can cope with it um, learning points pride don't do things <laughs> that you're that you're actually not capable of doing um, so it really really good question thanks that, that, that made me think I've never thought that before that'll go in my second book i think that one <laughs> the next one you've got is um <laughs> what animals have you seen in the air presumably all <laughs> uh, and then you've never stuck in the canopy yeah. oh that's brilliant uh, in the air with me um i, I well I, i've seen lots of small birds very briefly that turn into uh, you know pie pie uh um, mixture. Um, I don't know what they were. They just went bang, splat on the canopy. Um, I've uh, eagles. The slower you are, the, the more you can see bird wise because they're just they're almost not moving compared to an airplane. Um, eagles was was the best one. Uh, gliding with eagles, uh, it made the hairs in the back of my neck stick up. It was and it was the Hatchby Mountains, you know, all around snow covered. And these eagles were just they were the absolute masters of the air. 
Um, what else have I seen? I need, to, I need to think about that because I've never been asked that question before. <laughs> animals. Yeah, just birds, really. Um, yeah, I've flown past some geese and some ducks, um, almost all at low level. Um, very occasionally, I'll, I've seen something uh, in the sort of thousands of feet because birds don't tend to go up there. Um, and I once saw, a, I think, a duck in cloud. Um, I don't know what it was doing. I didn't. I don't know if birds can fly IMC. I don't. Well, obviously they can because this was <laughs> maybe it was lost or maybe it had a rating. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so yeah, a duck, some geese, um, lots of small birds, and uh, lots of eagles. Cool. Good question. Um, and the next one now is Martin, who wants to know: Can you say a bit more about the difference between Jet Provost, Tucano, and Hawk? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, right. The, well, they're all, uh, crikey, that, that's 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 a good question because the thing is they're so different. It's actually hard to put it into into words. I mean, so Jet Provost. Um, start with Tucano first because start with the bottom of the pile. That's that's a, a horrible machine. Um, it's it's a, it's it's a for those who don't know it's, it's a turboprop. It's got a sort of um, thousand horsepower engine, weighs a couple of tons. So its, it's, it's performance is quite good. You know, take off performance, max speed, that sort of stuff. Uh, but it, its design is fairly poor, um, and it's, it was built fairly poorly as well. Uh, poor workmanship. Um, so all of them flew differently. Each different one, even the same type of aeroplane, you get into it and it would have its own peculiarities. It would go, it would fly a little bit sideways. It'd make funny noises. You have to trim it a certain way. Very noisy, very smelly. You got a lot of um, the, the exhaust fumes in the cockpit. So you had to start the engine on 100% oxygen. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a challenge, a real challenge to fly. It, it, was, it was a pig, a pig of an aeroplane. Um, compare that to the Jet Provost, which it replaced, believe it or not. The, the Jet Provost was an absolute delight. I mean, it was um, Rolls-Royce quality. Like it was carved out of solid marble, lovely thing. Um, very, very stable, very good trainer. It, it, it didn't bite you or frighten you. It was a real, uh, you could really abuse it, uh, you know, and it, it just wouldn't bite you. You could, you could smack it in on landings. You could bend the wings off. Uh, it was just about unbreakable. Um, tremendous, tremendous airplane, pressurized as well, uh, very fast, you know, a sort of first airplane you go on and just 400 knots. Um, so it's, it's a nice downhill that is, it will do about 350 straight and level. Um, but then the Hawk is basically a faster Jet Provost, um, skinnier, so uh, tandem seating, bigger engine, um, sort of smaller wing, uh, again, an absolute delight to fly. Uh, really well designed, really well designed aeroplane. Superbly built. Um, no vices. It stalls like a straight wing aeroplane, not like a swept wing aeroplane. It can go supersonic in a dive, which you do on your on your um, on the course when you first fly. It's fantastic, um, and it's just it's very versatile. Never went wrong. I think it, it, uh, I've only got to about four hundred hours on the Hawk, but. The only thing that ever went wrong with it was a generator um, failure, which is no drama. You just got you got a battery, you just come back and land the thing. Um, so yeah, very reliable. Unlike the Takano, which it was like it, uh, shocking. I mean, the, the thing was going wrong all the time. You'd come in with a, a list of faults as long as your arm on, on that thing. Um, so all all very very different. Hated Takano. Uh, thought Jet Provost was great. Absolutely loved the Hawk. It, they just got it right with the Hawk. And it looks great as well, I think, anyway. Does that answer your question, or do you want some more detail on any of those? No, that's Whoever great, thank you. Yeah, very okay. Right, there's nothing more written in, so uh, anybody else out there with any questions for Stu? Looks like uh, everyone's staying quiet, so. <laughs> that's a nice one. Yeah, is one of me when I was a kid. <laughs> a little bit younger, yeah. Yeah, just a bit. <laughs> so 30 years younger. <laughs> uh, days before digital photography. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, I'll just give a few seconds. Anybody, anything else? Any more questions? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll read the book, but I'd love to see the film. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Top Gun 3, starring me. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to suggest perhaps you want you end with your, your funniest moment from your flying career. Oh, blimey. Um, that's interesting. That is interesting. Funny, funniest moment. Um, 
yeah, this is probably, uh, this is in my book, but I'll tell you anyway. Um, was uh, It wasn't, well, it's the only one I can remember really is, um, is landing as a student. I, I did a, a land away to um, Germany on the Hawk with my instructor. Uh, long story short, we plonk up into uh, RF Bruggen in Germany at the time um, uh, on the ILS and we're told to ex expedite because there's the, the Royal flights behind us. So, um, okay, we'll, um, we'll try and fly it fast. So I flew it fast, landed and they said, you need to get out of the way of the Royal flight that's coming in behind you. And so my instructor took control and taxied at, it's okay, I'm an instructor speed, if you know what I mean. So he parked the airplane, we got out of the airplane and by this time the Royal flight had uh, arrived somehow and was kind of next to us. Um, and for those who might, might know, the station warrant officer uh, was there to meet the entourage coming from the uh, Royal flight airplane. They had they were pulling out red carpet and stuff and me and my instructor were getting out of the, the Hawk. Um, and we had a really sweaty, horrible trip. So we like hair, like salad, we had, pipes and tubes and just sweat and just we just looked horrible and everything else around us had been whitewashed and scrubbed and red carpets and people in uniforms and medals and swords and all this sort of stuff and there's us just stood there between prince um somebody and and where he's going and um the station warrant officer says just shouts at us sirs you need to hide and so we're, we're out of ideas and all we've got to hide behind is a bush about about this big so <laughs> So we basically crouched down behind this bush, the two of us like this behind a bush. We couldn't, we were, we were even slightly hidden. This thing was smaller than a cat, this bush. And um, he comes out of his airplane and he, he starts walking down the uh, walking down the, the red carpet past us. And he clocks us, he, he looks at both of us and we thought, okay, we've been busted. So involuntarily, we just stood up to attention. Um, and so it's me and my instructor stood there, uh, all, all, all in our pipes and tubes and stuff. And my instructor panicked. You're not supposed to salute without a hat, but it's Prince Charles, so he panicked. And he, he did the salute. And as he saluted, all his pipes and tubes bounced out the side like this. And I, I then panicked with the black adder inside waist and salute as well like this with my pipes and tubes. <laughs> and you can see all the senior, he, Prince Charles found it funny, but all the senior people were literally, oh my God, what have we done? <laughs> So uh, we uh, we embarrassed um, we embarrassed the station warrant officer, um, but we amused the, the royals themselves. Um, so that was a, a, in hindsight an amusing amusing event, but not for the station warrant officer. If anyone knows what they're like. <laughs> Thank you, Stu. I uh, just got one more question in, Stu. Um, what advice did the doctor give to prevent retina detachment, other than doing what you were doing? Stop flying uh, was the advice. Um, uh, then once you have stopped flying and your retina has fixed itself, then don't do what you were doing before, uh, which luckily by then that particular test point had been completed. We, we, we'd done all the high, high negative to positive G points. So it wasn't going to happen again. Um, and it's, it's the reason it wasn't a problem for operational pilots with that airplane was because you wouldn't do that operationally. It's purely a, a test flying thing to see how much, um, if a pilot can withstand what the airplane's doing. Once you've once you figured out uh, the rate at which you can change G, uh, that's what you, you tune the flight controls to, so it doesn't break pilots. Um, but we had to figure out what the tuning was on that. So we had to go beyond the limits, which is what I did. Um, so it really, it, it kind of resolved itself. I just didn't, didn't do that anymore. Um, but I, I was, they, they were very seriously worried about my eyesight um, after that one. And it's only luck, actually, I found out about that because one of my friend's partners was a ophthalmic surgeon uh, and I was around her house, at their, their house for dinner. And I mentioned this and I could see her face go white um, and it went from there, really. Um, so had I not known that, I just thought I was being a bit wimpy or something or I'd got low dizzy. I don't know what it was. I, mean, I didn't know. I'm not a medical person. Um, but it just shows you, you, if you don't know, you, you don't know, do you? Yeah. All right, I think that's about it. So uh, someone may have asked this question already, um, Stu. But what's your favourite type of all the different types of aircraft you've flown? Which one do you enjoy the most? F eighteen. Um, it, it's it is an absolutely superb machine. Um, it's not the fastest. It doesn't pull the most G. It can't carry the most, and it can't go the furthest. But as a pilot, the aeroplane talks to you. Um, and that, that's actually really important when you're doing air combat because you haven't got to look inside at all your knobs and dials and parameters. The air, you, you can feel 
you can actually feel what speed the airplane is doing and what it's doing and how close you are to the limits. Um, so from, from a pure piloty air combat point of view, the F-18, it, it's, it's just an amazing machine. And it's also very um, abusable. You can, it has an unlimited AOA. Um, you know, like 90, 100, 120 degrees AOA. Think about that, it's bonkers, isn't it? So you can be firing your gun at somebody at 100 AOA um, and the airplane is still perfectly controllable. It's, it's in a massive super mega stall, but it's still, it's, well, it's not flying, it's in the air, but it's, it, you can still point it in various directions. Um, very, again, very reliable airplane. It, it, the only, um, in my four years flying it, the only thing ever went wrong uh, was uh, I had to shut an engine down um, and that was because of a spurious oil caption. Uh, oil, oil, low oil pressure. It, it wasn't actually low. Obviously, I didn't know that. Um, so shut the engine down. It flies fine on one engine, unlike the tornado. <laughs> yeah. Does that, does that answer your question? Good enough? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, lovely. Thanks. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah.